session of Congress. I thought he delivered an incredibly important address as it relates to the very close relationship between Japan and the United States of America, a relationship that has endured for decades, a relationship that is echoed in principles of democracy and freedom, and certainly a relationship that is incredibly important during this great moment of turmoil when we see forces of tyranny and totalitarianism and terror partnering with each other, including but not limited to in Ukraine as it relates to Russian aggression. And it is a real, clear, urgent need for American leadership as the Japanese Prime Minister made clear, and for the Congress to do its part to meet America's national security needs, which requires House Republicans to bring the bipartisan, comprehensive national security bill to the House floor for an up for the American people, job creation, remains up. More than 15 million good-paying jobs have been created under the leadership of President Joe Biden in less than four years, which represents phenomenal progress from the days of the COVID-19 pandemic and the shutdown of our economy. At the same point, Democrats realize that there's more that needs to be done to address inflationary pressures the issue of affordability, and to drive down costs for everyday Americans. And Democrats remain committed to building an economy from the middle out and the bottom up, to growing the middle class, and to making sure that we bring economic opportunity to every single zip code in the United States of America. For the middle class and all those everyday Americans who aspire to be part of the middle class. Questions? Is it hard as leader of the Democrats when the Republicans are in charge and they're constantly unable to move FISA, we don't know the path on Ukraine, there's all this toing and froing to say, okay, guys, this is what we're going to do. What, what is the attitude for, of Democrats when they're hearing all this and seeing this pandemic? From the very, very beginning of this Congress, we've made clear as Democrats that we will find bipartisan common ground with our Republican colleagues on any issue in order to make life better for the American people. And we have repeatedly done exactly that on issue after issue after issue, including most recently making sure that we funded the government in a way that met the needs of the American people in terms of their health, their safety, and their economic well-being. At the same time, we've also made clear that we are going to push back against Republican extremism whenever necessary. And we have had to repeatedly do it because the extreme MAGA Republicans are determined, for instance, to rip away reproductive freedom from the women of America and to impose their draconian economic philosophy, which is anchored in tax cuts for the wealthy, the well-off, and the well-connected. So we're going to continue to stay on this track of doing what is right for the American people and finding bipartisan common ground whenever and wherever possible, but at the same time pushing back against their extremism, specifically as it relates to what we've seen over and over and over again from this group of MAGA extremists on the other side of the aisle, it's clear to the American people that in Washington, D.C., we need more common sense, and that's the House Democratic governing philosophy, common sense, and less chaos. And unfortunately, what we've seen from House Republicans from the very beginning of this Congress is chaos, dysfunction, and extremism, and it hurts the American people. Is the Speaker getting marching orders from the President, the former President, who's going to lead them at mar a tomorrow? Do you hear that? That's a question that Speaker Johnson is going to have to answer himself. 
Thank you, Mr. Leader. Uh, what are House Democrats doing to make sure aid gets to Haiti? And then secondly, what are House Dems doing to make sure that members back a bill to fund the reconstruction of the collapsed bridge in Baltimore? Well, both issues are important. I'm going to have a conversation with Governor Westmore later on today. I have been in close touch with him, and our offices have been in communication with each other. And uh, Congressman Kwaisi Nfume has been leading the effort on behalf of the Maryland delegation to make sure uh, that we are able to provide the city of Baltimore, the people of Baltimore, and certainly uh, the immigrant families who have experienced the loss of a loved one with the support that they need uh, in this moment of great crisis. America needs to stand with the people of Haiti. Haiti's not in our backyard. Haiti's in our front yard. It is a part of the Americas. Haitian Americans are an important part of this country's gorgeous mosaic. The United States uh, has secured a commitment from Kenya and other nations in Africa and the Caribbean to provide security assistance on the ground in Haiti. But we need the Congress to do its part and release the $40 million in security assistance that is necessary for the Kenyans and others to be able to have the resources necessary to turn around the security situation in Haiti. We sent a letter to Speaker Johnson weeks ago urging him to urge the Republican chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee to release the hold so that the $40 million in security assistance to the people of Haiti can be distributed in a manner that will allow for the chaotic situation to be addressed. And it should have happened yesterday. It needs to happen immediately. Thanks. Have you begun discussions with Speaker Johnson about the U.K. package? And if he moves on that, would you um, maybe tell him to look at the case? The only way forward at this late hour is for House Republicans to put the bipartisan, comprehensive national security bill on the House floor for an up or down vote so we can provide support for our Democratic allies in Ukraine, Israel, the Indo-Pacific, including Japan, as well as make sure we can surge humanitarian assistance to Palestinian civilians who are in harm's way in Gaza through no fault of their own, and other civilians in theaters of war throughout the United States of America. That is the only path forward. Enough with the delays, the obstruction, the gamesmanship, the obfuscation. Enough. The world is on fire. American leadership is required. The entire post-World War II rules-based society on the global stage is at risk if because of inaction in the do-nothing Republican House we fail to provide Ukraine with the support that it needs to push back against Russian aggression. There's only one path forward. Now, I've made the observation, not a declaration, the observation that if the Speaker were to do the right thing and allow the House to work its will with an up or down vote on the national security bill, then I believe that there are a reasonable number of Democrats who would not want to see the Speaker fall as a result of doing the right thing. Observation, not a declaration, because we have to have a conversation I didn't necessarily mean to rhyme there, <laughs> but a conversation amongst ourselves as House Democrats uh, before making such a solemn decision. So does that mean you're ruling out supporting any other type of package? Our view, quite clearly, and it was expressed this morning 
in the WIP meeting hosted by the Honorable Catherine Clark, who's doing a great job, is that the only path forward is an up or down vote on the bipartisan comprehensive national security bill. Paul? I believe that there are a sufficient number of votes to make sure that the national security bill makes it over the legislative finish line if it's brought to the House floor between the House Democratic Caucus and the House Republican Conference. I saw yesterday that the Republicans failed to pass a rule on FISA. Would Democrats support a standalone rule for a FISA reauthorization, and has Speaker Johnson spoken to you? No and no. On MP7, um, discharge position. It also doesn't have full support of Democrats. Have you been talking to your colleagues uh, if they are willing to sign this discharge petition and to, to move forward with the bill? Uh, I think the discharge petition now has north of the support of 90% of House Democrats. I think we are currently uh, somewhere around 194 or 195, some additional members signed today. I think we have two Republicans who joined us. The problem is not on the Democratic side. The problem is on the Republican side. Two Republicans out of 217 believe that it's urgent at this moment to put the bipartisan national security bill on the floor so we can provide support for Ukraine, Israel, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and humanitarian assistance to people who are struggling throughout the world, to Republicans. The problem is not on the Democratic side. And if just a handful of Republicans, 20 or 25 at most, were willing to join House Democrats, we can do what's necessary to protect America's national security needs. Back. Yeah, I need to have a conversation with Jim Himes, uh, as well as the Democrats on the Intel Committee who've been closest uh, to this issue, as well as Chairman Meeks of the Foreign Affairs, soon to be Chairman Meeks of the Foreign Affairs uh, Committee, once in future Chairman Meeks, as well as uh, Adam Smith and others before, you know, I'm going to weigh in on the issue of length of time connected to the reauthorization. Okay, go back to this side. During your conversations with the Japanese Prime Minister, did you bring up any type of reforms to the status of, sorry, I'm nervous, right? To the status of forces agreement that's between the United States and Japan uh, to avoid a situation like the one that happened at Ridge Alcona should never happen again? Yeah, that did not come up in the private conversations that I was a part of. We more broadly talked about uh, continued security cooperation between the United States and Japan, some of the challenges in the Indo-Pacific, as well as, of course, some of the challenges in the world, similar to the themes that the Japanese Prime Minister hit upon in his address, because we're confronting across the world a conflict between the forces of freedom and the forces of tyranny, the forces of democracy and the forces of autocracy, the forces of truth and the forces of propaganda, the United States, Japan, our other democratic allies stand on the right side of that divide and we'll have to look for ways to continue to make sure we operationalize it. Now, do you think that service members overseas need to be guaranteed the right to an attorney or the right to a translator? Yeah, that issue didn't come up. Uh, and I defer to the administration right now with respect to the particulars. Mr. Leader, uh, we saw another ruling on abortion uh, in Arizona further restricting uh, the practice. Uh, do you believe that these rulings in the wake of Roe v. Wade being overturned 
Does that expand your map when you're looking to take back the majority? And do you believe Donald Trump when he says that he would not sign a national abortion ban? Now, Donald Trump is lying. This is an individual who has said, along with the other extreme MAGA Republicans, that they are proud to have taken down Roe v. Wade. Donald Trump put three Supreme Court justices in place, several of whom, in my view, misrepresented their position before the United States Senate, claiming that Roe v. Wade was settled law. And then the first opportunity they had took Roe v. Wade down and put the women of America in a position where abortion care has been criminalized in state after state after state. The extreme agro Republicans have been very clear. They do not believe in a woman's freedom to make her own reproductive health care decisions. The only reason the former president is claiming to be for states' rights is because he knows he's not for women's rights when it comes to reproductive freedom. And he recognizes that he's in a politically vulnerable position. But there is absolutely zero reason to believe that the extreme MAGA Republicans, the first chance that they had with a Congress controlled by right-wing conservatives, and God help us all, a Republican president would not impose a nationwide ban on abortion. It's what drives a significant number of the Republicans who are part of their base. If Roe v. Wade can fall after nearly 50 years, everything is on the table. And it's not just reproductive freedom. It's Social Security. It's Medicare. And many of us believe it's democracy itself. Do you think that expands your map then, sir? That's a question that we'll have to address on the non-governmental side. What is clear is that the women of America, the enlightened people of America, in November are going to express themselves loudly and clearly. And the Republicans who want to criminalize abortion care and who want to impose a nationwide ban are on the wrong side of this issue, the wrong side of history, and are likely to be on the wrong side of the election results. What's your message to the 20 or so Democrats that you have in caucus who have not signed on to this resolution on the November election? There are ongoing conversations uh, with the House Democratic Caucus about the best way forward in terms of ensuring an up or down vote on the bipartisan national security bill. But the reality of the situation that we confront is clear. The only way to get the bill over the finish line is with Democrats and Republicans partnering with each other. We have already demonstrated that we will provide more than our fair share of the votes to get the national security bill done. All we need is a handful of Republicans, 20 or 25, to join us. It started this Congress with 222 Republican members. All we need is 20 or 25 on every single issue of significance throughout this entire Congress, House Democrats who are in the minority have provided the overwhelming majority of votes to get things done for the American people. And on the issue of the national security bill, we are ready, willing, and able to do the same. We just need a handful of traditional Republicans to break with the MAGA extremists and join us to lift up America's national security.
Well, right, Speaker Johnson. Okay. With respect, you were just checking to see if I was paying attention. Uh, with respect, with respect to the agenda moving forward, as we have repeatedly said, as House Democrats, we want to work together to solve problems for hardworking American taxpayers. We will continue to put people over politics and to fight for things that matter, like lower costs, growing the middle class, safer communities, defending democracy, and building an economy from the middle out and the bottom up. And if our Republican colleagues with their ever-shrinking majority are willing to join us on any issue, as long as it will make life better for the American people, we will continue to extend the hand of bipartisanship. Does it change your strategy at all? It doesn't change our strategy at all. We continue to make clear that the only path forward is an up or down vote on the bipartisan comprehensive national security bill passed by the Senate. It's my understanding that the same point has been repeatedly made to House Republicans by the Biden administration, Leader Schumer, and Leader McConnell. Everybody else in Washington, D.C. is in agreement that there's only one path forward, and that's put the Senate bill on the House floor for an up or down vote, and I guarantee it will pass with a strong bipartisan majority. Yeah, I strongly support Congresswoman Clark's efforts, as well as the legislation uh, connected to the discharge petition. It's my understanding that her legislation, which would allow the Affordable Connectivity Benefit Program to continue to be funded in ways that benefit the American people all across the country, in inner city America, rural America, suburban America, exurban America, small town America, and the heartland of America. That's a good thing. That's a win for everyone. And Congresswoman Clark's legislation has bipartisan support and more co-sponsors, as I understand it, than the number necessary to pass the bill out of the House. And so one way or the other, we have to get it to the floor. Thanks. Uh, no, with respect to the second question, and he and I haven't had that conversation about um, going into the district. Did President Biden take executive action to shut down the vehicle? I think the administration should pursue uh, every available avenue to bring about a safe, a strong, and secure border. We also need a humane border. The best path forward, as President Biden and the administration has articulated, uh, is a comprehensively agreed upon legislative proposal that could move out of the House and the Senate. Unfortunately, we found ourselves in a situation where the extreme MAGA Republicans are taking orders from their puppet master down in Mar-a-Lago, who killed a bipartisan bill designed to address border security in the United States of America because the extreme MAGA Republicans don't want to solve the border security issue. They want to exploit the border security issue in November. 
I do not believe uh, that the Biden administration has given up hope for a different path forward, but all options should be on the table in terms of executive action if it becomes clear that the legislative avenue has been closed off by Republicans preferring partisan political stunts over addressing the needs of the American people, including as it relates to border security. Thank you, everyone.